Amen. Isn't that glorious? So I'm going to hand over, well, let me just welcome Dave to you because some of you won't know him and uh, the team from California, but uh, I've known Dave far too long, 30 odd years, I think. And uh, I remember my first trip to California as this little English boy, this huge other world that was a lot bigger than England and a lot more. Well, Dave just introduced me to various places to eat out, I think, in general. And, uh, I, got to, I got to see the Anaheim Vineyard in Revival. I got to see what that, what that was like, to see a move of God, to experience something of, of the, the greatness of God moving. How we long to see all that um, yet again. So I'm going to hand over and... Go ahead. Yeah. You're very welcome. And I've forgotten your name. Billy. 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 I, I shouldn't forget that name because yeah, I've got his now. Anyway, come on, welcome. And, uh, Billy's going to give a prophetic word. So just stand next to him and yeah. the mic. Yeah. Yeah, yeah thank you. Uh, I just, you know, it says let one judge and let, the, let one prophesy and the judge. You know that. So. Discern, okay? But I felt like I felt like the Lord says it. I feel like the Lord says it. Revival will tarry until it comes. But I feel like the Lord says, as as the uh, as the widow of the uh, of the uh, as the widow of the sons of the prophet had a, a, a jar of oil. The Lord says, bring your jars of oil. Bring your jars of oil, not a few. Bring your jars of oil, many. And the Lord says he will take this jar you have and pour it into many jars. And as the jars are filled up, they will, you know, it'll multiply and multiply and multiply. It'll multiply into the streets. It'll multiply into the city. The Lord says he will multiply the oil that you have here. And it will be uh, refreshing. Refreshing to the city until re until revival comes. But it let, so revival will tarry until it comes. But the Lord says, but multiply the oil you have here. Multiply just means just give it away, give it away, give it away, and let the Lord Amen. Let, let the Lord take it and let the Lord do what, what He wants with you. By the way, this is a great. I, I love this church. I love the building for one thing. I love I love what's here. <laughs> That's all, so, hallelujah. <laughs> yeah, hallelujah. Thank you, Bill. <clears throat> Thank you, Bill. <laughs> Thank you. I, I tell you, well, the first time I took Chris to a restaurant, this is back in the day when it was still a good place, but I took him to a place called Claim Jumper, and they had, like, sandwiches that were that tall, and I ordered him one. And they had beers that were this big. And I ordered him one. And he just looked and he says, I love America. I love America. That's true. That's true. And that a true story. I'm not exaggerating. Not exaggerating. Well, thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you for welcoming our team. Uh, we've had a good time here so far. And... Um, you got to forgive me for a little bit. Uh, I haven't worked through this message thoroughly in my heart or in my head. It's just a thought the Lord gave to me, and I thought I would have more time to really try and develop it. So forgive me for being the guinea pigs. So, uh, you know, it, 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 it has a lot to do with thinking of, of how I came into the church and what happened when I came into the church and, and what I became as I, as I lived in the church. And I really, I, I don't, I'm not trying to put any guilt on anybody or shame on anybody that maybe you, you've done too much or you haven't done enough or whatever. I, I really am just sharing with you what I feel like God is, one, speaking in my heart, but also just putting in my heart, right? And, and maybe even a prayer for my own church back home. And so, to kind of start with, as, as a kid, I was the kid that you never wanted to meet. 
I, I just was. I was a troublemaker. And not only a troublemaker, but I was mean. I, I was obviously was very insecure. When you're a bully, when you're a mean person, you, I, I guarantee it's almost 99% out of just you're insecure. You think nobody's going to ever love you. You don't think anybody's ever going to like you. You're not going to fit into here. You're not going to fit into there. And... Uh, I remember when I first got saved in Anaheim Vineyard and, and uh, this, this young lady walked up to my wife and says, is that your husband? And she said, yeah. And she says, is his name Dave King? And she said, it is. And she said, he must have walked into the wrong place because the Dave King I know would never belong in this place. He would never belong because she knew me since I was in fourth grade all the way through school. And she said, he was the meanest person alive. <laughs> and uh, my wife said, well, we're hoping he's changing. <laughs> but it really was, it was this journey, right? And it's, and so in it too, because when I became a Christian, I, I wasn't... I don't know how to put it. I, like, it wasn't... I was ashamed that I went to a church. But I was also ashamed that I was this other person. And so church for me became a very private club. I didn't let anybody know that I went to church. I didn't lead any of my friends to Christ because of this. I mean, I, I had this great and powerful conversion. I mean, it, it was one of the most wonderful things in my life happened that day. I accepted Christ. I mean, I, I met Christ in a very powerful way. I should have been the guy on the rooftop that was telling the whole world about Jesus. And yet I was ashamed because maybe I thought church was a little too weird. And I also thought my friends were way too mean. They wouldn't fit in the church. They wouldn't be accepted. I just got lucky. You know, the day I walked in, I just got, I felt like I just got lucky. And so, in, in this thought process, you know, I thought, well, how do we get people like Dave King into a church? Because I'm telling you, there's a whole world of Dave Kings out there. There's a whole world of hurting, broken, confused people. And, and that's all I was. I mean, really, I promise you. I was broken. I, I, I was broken. A lot of self-inflicted pain, but also, you know, just stuff that I inherited through my family. And our, our family was a family of brokenness. There was one point as a child I can think, well, I, I could never figure out at first when I was real young, how come I had like eight sets of grandparents? But my friends only had two. <laughs> Like, you just did, like, I, I couldn't figure out the math in my head. Like, how did I get so lucky to have eight sets of grandparents? I didn't realize it was from brokenness. I didn't realize that every single family member on either side of the family that I could think of, and, and this is adding even in the, the divorce and marriage and remarried pe people in my family, I didn't realize I, or, I mean, I did realize they were all either alcoholics, they were all or drug addicts, or both. Uh, everybody committed adultery in my family. Everybody. Uh, I couldn't think of any. I, I mean, I have one grandmother married seven times. You know, and I mean, that's in the 40s. That, that, that wasn't like it's today where it's much more acceptable to, to, to say you're divorced. Uh, you know, that grandmother had three kids, three different dads, but married seven times. And uh, I just, there was a lot of stuff like that that you, you carry shame. And when you carry that shame, you feel like you never belong. You feel like you never belong. And so I began to think about how did Jesus deal with people like Dave King? How did Jesus deal with people like Dave King? And I think uh, if, if I can get this right, 
Now I've lost all my phone, Chris's phone, my phone. I think I gave your phone away. Well, that one's yours. I get my Bible out here. Uh, if we start with at, uh, at Luke 2, I mean fi fi chapter 15, verse 2. And it, it's just a short little thing here, but it says the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And when I came into Anaheim Vineyard 38 years ago, that's what the Jesus I met. He sat down and he ate with me. He was kind to me. You know, if it had been up to that girl that I went to school with, she would have put a wall around it like Trump and wouldn't have let me in. She wouldn't have. I, I wouldn't have had to write paperwork. I wouldn't have had to write pedigree. She felt like, like church was for nice people. It was never meant to be for nice people. You're all nice people. But the truth is, we got all our luggage back there. It should be, we should be worried about our luggage. We should be worried that our luggage might get stolen because there should be sinners in here. There should be thieves and prostitutes and drug addicts, homosexuals. They should be filled with those kind of people because those are the kind of people that Jesus lived his life amongst. He walked with them. He touched them. He, he felt their pain. He, he experienced everything that they were. He didn't run and hide and think, God, we cannot let them through the doors. They'll ruin this place. <laughs> They'll ruin a place. If Maybe if you had 10 Dave Kings in here, this place would be in shambles. <laughs> because... But we should have 100 Dave Kings. Because God loves us. I, I, I understand after 38 years and a lot of pain walking out those 38 years that God loves me now. That he loves me. That he goes to the depths of the, the, the darkest and dirtiest places you could imagine in your mind. That's where he found me again and again and again. That's where he found me. And so, you know, you, you have family members and you have neighbors and you have people that you work with that are dying for this message of love. And, and that's, that's really what it is, is just a message of love. It's a message of that the same way Jesus loved you into the kingdom, you can love your neighbor, you can love your work person, you can love everybody into the kingdom and you can it's it's a job that he's put before us and uh, I, uh my friend donna schroeder last night she told me a story about I, I i don't know if you heard bob tell it or or bob told it to you directly he just told him yeah in, in a meeting bob jones prophet who's gone and he's with the lord now but he told her he said when he you know when he got struck by lightning and he died and he went to heaven and he was he met Jesus and Jesus grabbed him by his face and looked into his eyes because he wanted to see how much of his own reflection did he see in Bob and then he asked Bob did you love did you love that's what he's going to ask us when we get to heaven did you love and are you loving your neighbor as you love yourself? Are you caring for people who don't deserve your care? I, I, I promise you, like I didn't deserve anybody's kindness. If, if, if I got what I deserved, I'd be in a box already or locked up in a prison if I got what I deserved. But Jesus intervenes. It's Jesus in you that will intervene into people's lives, into your own family members, into your own family members that I, I know there are people here today that their kids are, are, are addicted to drugs. 
that their kids are, uh, have sexual identity problems, that their kids are broken, and you think, how do I fix them? Well, Jesus, why don't you save them? Why don't he save them? Because he's looking for you to enter into their life, and not with judgment, but with love. Amen. That's what he's called us to, to, to not be a people of judgment. Not to. Not to be a people of judgment. We are not the police. We are not the border patrol. <laughs> you know, we're not. This is, this is an open, open border country. <laughs> this, is, this is an open border country. And, and that's okay. And that's okay. Because it's our job to fill this building. Amen. It really is. That's what revival looks like. You know, there was a day, and, 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 and my friends here in the front row, uh, and some of the other people, uh, my wife, they can remember a day that people showed up for church an hour early, and as soon as they opened the door, they ran through the doors so they could get a seat. That's what we long for again, right? That's what we're looking for. When we talk about revival, when we talk about revival, that's what we're talking about. We're talking for people busting down these doors to get in. You know, you, you, you didn't have to recruit people to set up because they wanted to set up because that way they could get a seat. You know, you didn't have to, you didn't have to Put people in their, uh, you know, an arm behind their back to work with the children because the children were getting saved. The, the children were praying people. They were seeing miracles. You know, if you were a high school worker, you might get a wife. <laughs> so, hey, and he's not the only one. Hey, that's not true. That's a lie. <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> you met her when she, you were a junior high worker. Yeah, so, you know, I think, hopefully, hopefully I gave my friend here the, the right, um, okay, uh, John 4 through, uh, chapter 4, 4 through 26. And Jesus dealing with the Samaritan woman. He shouldn't have been dealing with her, right? I mean, we all know the story. We all know the story. Where Jesus interacts with her. And if you were of that was woman at the well, if you were if you were a, a Orthodox you would believe she's a saint. She became one of the greatest evangelists in the world in, in that time. They, they traced people she led to Christ all the way into Africa. And you ministered in, in miracles and healings and in power. Because what did Jesus do? He took time out of his day to share a small truth with her that changed your life. You guys have Jesus, you have the same spirit that lives inside you. You have the same power with inside of you to change people's lives like the Samaritan woman and you can lead people all around the world to Christ. You just have to do it. You got to enter into it with him. It's a partnership. Look, at he does all the hard work. He really does. We think it's a hard work because we could might face rejection. I, I mean, I'm just speaking for myself. I, 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 I'm a lot of times become very afraid because I'm afraid I'm going to uh, face rejection, and I don't like rejection. I don't care for rejection. I want everybody to like me. You would think, even though I'm mean, I, you, I, I still, I want everybody to like me. I'm afraid that you, they'll say I'm a fanatic, I'm a, I'm a crazy, I'm a goof. But why do I care? 
It's just like what Chris told the people of the people on our team. Hey, pray for whoever. Prophesy over them because they're never going to see you again. <laughs> it's the same way uh, when you're on the when you're on the tube or you're in the bus or you're uh, or at the market or whatever. You're liable to never see them again. Just just put the word out there. Let God do the hard work. God does all the heavy lifting. Then uh, uh, John 8, 1 through 11, the woman caught in adultery. That, uh, that woman was supposed to die that day. She was supposed to have her life taken from her. Nowhere do you see the man in the story, but that woman was supposed to die. And what did Jesus do? He spared her life. See, you have the same chance to do the same thing to somebody else. You have a chance to spare their life over against making a judgment on them that they deserve what they get. Yeah, how many times have you said that in your head when you see somebody handcuffed and going to jail? Well, they're just getting what they deserve. No, what they deserve is to come across a person like you, like you, like you, that's going to show them love. That's going to show them kindness. And that hopefully they're going to turn from their ways. You know, my poor grandmother, this, this lady had five husbands, it said. My poor grandmother who uh, had seven, nobody ever showed her no kindness. Nobody showed I, I, I don't know if she's in heaven or hell. I don't know that it's somewhere in there. Maybe she didn't. But she never lived the life of a Christian. And it isn't good enough just for us to say a prayer. It, I mean, really, think about it. We're, this life that we're called to live and that we begin to live out, it's a pretty amazing journey. You know, I, I, I was outside of the church for 10 years of that 38 years. And I can remember just longing, oh God, if I could just have one more chance. If I could just have one more chance. To be outside of the church is the most loneliest place in the world. When you know the church and you decided to leave. And this is why, you know, probably a lot of your children, they're prodigals. Or, or, or you know, your relatives or your neighbors. There's a good chance they're just prodigals. And, but you know what? I'm going to tell you. I know this for a fact. They're the loneliest people in the world. Because they once knew how good it was. They had tasted of God. I had tasted of God and I threw my life away. And only by the grace of God do I stand here today and I'm able to share with you. Because what I deserved, I didn't get. What I deserved, I didn't get. And that's the beauty of Jesus. None of us get what we deserve. None of us. We could all stand up here and tell a story where we deserve much worse than we have in life right now. And yet God spares us. Just like this, this woman caught in adultery. And I think it's the last one. And then we'll try to close so we can do some ministry. Man, I hate technology. I got this all in this long text. I got to text it to myself so I don't lose it. <laughs> Luckily, I have two phones. Yeah, call myself, yeah. I, I have a word, X marks the spot. Um, you have it, right? Yes. Yeah, Matthew 16. Yeah, Matthew 16. So maybe I gave you the wrong one. I gave you the wrong one. We'll just go with it. We'll make one up. Huh? The Zacchaeus. What, what verse is it? 
Same thing. We, we give Matthew, when he called Matthew, he was a tax collector. We could go Zacchaeus, who was, you know, up in the tree, right? He's up in the tree. We, we could think, uh, literally, I, I found in just an hour on an airplane 40 verses where Jesus interacts with people. And, 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 and the, the theme of it is this, is that he's kind to people. He is kind. The only time he was ever harsh was to the church. The only time he was ever harsh was to the church. And so I don't want Jesus to show up here today and him be harsh. I don't want to experience his harshness. I want, to, I want him to look in my face. I want him to squeeze my face and hopefully he see Jesus. And that's really the moral of the story. That's... And, and you can say, well, that's Chris's job because he's the pastor. Or that's the young lady that led worship. That's her job because she's the worship leader. And no way. Nobody gets off the hook in this deal. We're all called to the same thing. And it's to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. He, what do you say first? Love the Lord your God with all your heart. And then love your neighbor as you love yourself. And so, as a group, let's commit to that today. Let's commit to it. That's what they're going to call you to. Now, I think some of the guys on my team might have some words or, uh, or that. And so, I'm going to call them up and we're going to do a little ministry. And if you guys have some, this isn't just about California. If you guys have words, we want to hear them. I'm from Oregon, not California. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, Chris is from me. And uh, so I don't really know each other. I mean, we crossed paths a couple times. I don't know your journey. When you were praying before service and that kind of waiting time, uh, for just a, a moment, it was, it was a weird thing, it was just a brief moment. I felt the Lord's heart for you. It's just a second. And, and it was really precious. And it's one of those things you wish you could hang on to, but it went away. So, uh, so a couple things. Uh, one is I'll, I'll agree with Billy. If this is good, it's good. If it's not, throw it out. Um, but, th but this is what I felt like the Lord showed me for you. Um, it says, He will bestow on you a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. You will be called an oak of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of His splendor. Come on. You will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. Strangers will shepherd your flocks. Foreigners will work your fields and vineyards. And you will be called priests of the Lord. You will be named ministers of our God. You will feed on the wealth of nations and in the riches you will boast. Instead of your shame, you will receive a double portion and instead of grace, you will rejoice in the inheritance and so you will inherit a double portion in your land and everlasting joy will be yours. Amen. Amen. That's all I got. Don, I got to stand next to you because there's this other microphone that picks it up for the feed. Get it here. Um, when Dave was uh, talking, I got reminded again of a verse that just keeps coming up this whole time, this whole trip in England. And one was um, just first of all, the story of Bob Jones telling the story about when he died, and we're like, he died, and he went to heaven, and I mean, Jesus, I mean, we were just like, what? But really what I got from that is, you know, at the end of the day, it's like, did you learn to love? That's what he said, yeah. did you learn? And for me, it just gave me that etern a gift of eternal perspective for the rest of my life. Like, this is, that's what it's about. I'm not gonna stand before Jesus with Glenn, <coughs> With anybody else, it's just me and him, and it's my life, and what, and I need to learn how to love. And um, and the second thing, the scripture that kept coming to mind is um, in Galatians when Paul is saying that he is again in the pains and labors of Calvary until Christ is 
formed within us. And this theme of less of us and more of Christ, you know, we're all, every single one of us, the littlest ones to the oldest ones, we're all like in the same boat. He's doing the same, the same work in us all the time to form Christ within us. And that we're all in the same boat. Like nobody's different. It's like house you know. And really, when I was thinking about that, it's like he's not he's saying less of you and more of me because the true me, the true self that he's created me to be, all of the giftings, the talents, the creativity, all of the love, and everything he's given me, that true self is sometimes buried underneath a bunch of junk. And he wants to free us of that junk so that we could really be free and be all that he is and everything in us to be to reflect him. And let's see, I'll get that other, last verse here. Um, two things. One is, um, and then I just felt like this, that God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of the world, the despised things, and the things that are not to nullify the things that are, so that no one can boast before him. And we're all broken, we're you know, so imperfect, and we're just we're all in that same place, you know. It's like just keep saying yes and yes to the Lord. Amen. I also felt like he gave me a word of two things. One is that there might be some women here that are barren and um, I want to pray for you. And there might also be some people that just feel barren in their spirit. Like they're not, there's something, like when you want a baby, you're longing and dreaming. And you hope, like month to month, is this is the time I'm going to get, you know, that hope of having a baby and it doesn't happen. And I think there's other people spiritually that are dry, but even dry um, in their creativity that God wants to birth like new life in you and new creative things, like even intelligence, like mathematical scientific <laughs> solutions. I mean, I'm serious, like that he just wants to birth these like really new and exciting things in us. And that if you're barren and you feel this longing and ache in that, and also just the moans and groans that he had a, until Christ is formed within us, that that's an intercessory gift, and that there might be some here that God wants to release um, that intercessory gift. My word. Uh, the word I have for you is I see. Uh, there are people here that feel like that there's, they're not being seen. But they, they've kind of been lost amongst the crowd. But God says, I see you. I see your heart. I see you. I care for you. And I'm going to pull you through. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I have some words of knowledge. Okay. Um, somebody here with a right ankle that's swollen and it could have had a fracture once. Um, and I saw like a hairline fracture coming down the like the bone structure of the um, going into your ankle. So the shin kind of like coming into that area and it was like a hairline crack and it didn't heal all the way. It still went kind of painful. And then heart murmurs or flutters. Um, that, what the symptoms are of that is like you feel like fainting or dizziness. If you have any of that where you're feeling a little dizzy. Um, because some people might not know they have that. So, um, and then a bleeding ulcer would be like stomach, <coughs> your stomach hurts. And if you're living on antacids all the time and you're having to take those, um, that's what uh, the Lord was saying. He that's, to that also comes from being fat. <laughs> I happen to know. Hey, don't don't take that personally. If you stand up, you're not fat, okay? <laughs> um, okay, and then um, I have, um, let's see, a woman uh, with blonde hair, or um, could have had blonde hair. Um, <laughs> we all color. <laughs> and, um, but her left eye has, um, it's, 
Uh, the Lord gave me, sometimes he gives me these real scientific words, so I'm converting it back to English. <laughs> but refractive errors, and it's called a type of vision problem that makes it hard to see clearly in their left eye. And um, it's because of the shape of the eye, and so the light, how it focuses. And then there's somebody that might have a child with a speech impediment, and um, I don't know if they're going to speech right now, and um, a woman with extreme loss about a child, and that might go with what Donna said about a child. Okay. 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 Can the worship team come back up? You didn't leave, did you? <laughs> if any of these words any even close to you, we're going to invite you to come up as we worship, and we're happy to pray for you. And if there's a word, if you have a condition, you have an ailment, you you have a need in your life that you only God can meet, I want you also to come up because we're going to pray for you. We believe in miracles, and and I know Chris believes in miracles, so uh, we want you to come forward. Yeah, I've seen cancers disappear. I've seen tumors disappear. I've seen backs with metal rods bend, where God changes the molecular structure of the back, and a metal rod with scoliosis. So I know God heals. So I mean, if there's anybody sick, I mean, you know, God's doing it today. So don't be afraid to come up. We're gonna pray. Amen. Take your place, take every part.